Welcome. Good evening. Hope, hope you had a great Thanksgiving. It's good to be back with you on Wednesday night. And we, we have three, uh, three Wednesday nights left. And so we, we thought, well, let's give the people something to talk about, good or bad or curse their pastors, whatever. Let's jump into a little bit of eschatology. All right, that's a big fancy theological word that means the study of the end of times. Now, if you're asking yourself, well, what on earth could they possibly cover in three sessions on eschatology? You are right. We are going to keep this high level um, and try and stay out of the weeds that get into a lot of arguments. Okay? Um, the, uh, the arm wrestling match over uh, some, some of the finer details. Uh, I have zero desire to get into those discussions. I like to think uh, that I approach my eschatology with a bit of humility because um, this certainly is something that, that we do not divide over. Um, we, uh, we can agree to disagree. We can have spirited, well-meaning debates. Uh, there are just a handful of things that you must agree to uh, eschatologically, and that is that, that Jesus will return physically. We're talking about a physical, literal uh, returning of Jesus Christ. Um, and, and so there, there are a handful of those issues that, that yeah, 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 we'll divide over. But, but for the most part, uh, part of our aim in doing this is to, uh, one, obviously address the, the cultural topic that's going on tonight. We're going to address Israel. But pastorally, to be able to, uh, um, I was still obligated to, to teach you to read your Bible well, and to be introduced to topics and have a very fair, balanced view on at least these are the issues that are being discussed. This is why it's complex. Uh, we don't have to parse it out, but outside of this is the issue, and this is why this group takes it this way and this group takes it that way. Ringing a little bit, Bobby. You got that, okay. Uh, so with that, what we're going to do uh, tonight, we're talking about Israel, and Daniel's going to give us that introduction. Really, we're going to talk a lot about Israel and the church. And so um, we may have some time for some questions at the end. Undoubtedly, in a room like this, probably 90% of you are, uh, you're going to listen, you're going to take notes, and you're going to be like, man, that was interesting. Maybe 10% of you are going to say, I don't, I don't think, he didn't do it the way I would have done it. And uh, uh, you, you might have a tendency to... Uh, uh, it's not like the questions are bad, but uh, as, as far as what we can discuss and talk about tonight, it, there's not a whole lot of room for, if we do take questions or someone interjects from the crowd, uh, for you to go on a long, uh, your own presentation of your own eschatology, this really isn't the place for that. So, so just for the sake of conducting business here this evening. Uh, if, if you do interject, that, that might be received appropriately, or, or it might be shut down and quickly moved back to just the presentation. Uh, and, and it's not that either Daniel or myself, by the way, Chad couldn't be here because uh, he had his own perspectives, and he'll be here uh, with us in the next two weeks. And so, he said if you have a presentation that you want to share, he'd be happy to set up the time for you to come. Yeah, back. he wants to he hear wants your to hear. presentation. Yeah, so <laughs> set up those meetings. Absolutely. <laughs> when you see them, you let him know we said that. <laughs> He's excited. All right, with that said, uh, let's pray and then let's jump into it, okay? Heavenly Father, uh, we love you and we love your son. You have saved us and we love your word. And uh, you are the author of history and, and you have been unfolding 
all of history. <laughs> Your word is magnificent. It, it goes back uh, over the course of a 2,000 year period of, of writing and unfolding that the fact that, that you have revealed yourself over time through uh, a, a progressive revelation where this, this unfolding of the coming of your son and then Father, we, we, your word teaches us that we long to look forward and to think and to understand what is in front of us. We, we certainly want to do that with a great bit of humility, um, as well as understanding what we can be certain of and what is solid foundation. Um, and Father, you, your word teaches us to think well about these things, and so we aim to do that. Uh, we pray for wisdom that comes from you. We pray for understanding that comes from you. We pray for conviction that comes from your word. Um, and we want, uh, we, we pray that you would help us to apply it to our lives, uh, especially as we, we wrap our mind and head around all that's going on in, in current events. Uh, and so we lift this up. We love you, and we want to meet with you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And so we tonight, we there's a lot of places we could have started, but we wanted to start here by looking at this relationship between Israel and the church and how we're to think well and biblically about that. Anytime something happens, uh, it takes when Israel takes center stage in world news, one of the first questions that comes up so many times in the evangelical world is, is this the end? It, you can just plan on it. Like that, those, those questions, those thoughts are going to arise. And so this is a good chance for us to sit down and talk about us. How are we to think about this little piece of land and this, this people group, right, in a place that is the size of New Jersey in the Middle East? Like, how are we to think about that? Well, we think about them like, like we would think as believers biblically about people. They are people made in God's image. They are people that God has a plan for, right? They are a people right now who have been under attack, right? They have been the recipients of, of evil that has been directed toward them, and they are hurting, and they are trying to respond. And so as believers, we have a job just like we would for, for anyone to pray for them, to, to try to help meet needs that they may have, right? We, we understand when we think biblically, they are a special people. God, God has used them in a special way throughout history. Scripture shows how he will continue to work through them and use them. And so we do, we pray for them. We support them because they are a people that God loves. They are a people that Jesus died for. Uh, they are a people right now who are suffering. They have in, they are enduring persecution, and they are trying to respond to that. And so we would come alongside them, like we should do as as believers, to say we are here, we stand with you, we pray for you, we care about what's happening, and we pray for this these situations to be opportunities for the gospel. Right to have to take center stage in their lives. Right when when things happen in our lives, when we endure moments of crisis, and we we in in different ways in different arenas of our lives, these are opportunities for Christ to work. Right for people to see their need for a savior, and what an opportunity with what is happening right now with the evil, with the hate, with the with the with the suffering, with the loss. Right? This is an opportunity for the church to shine the light of Jesus into a hurting environment in what is going on in Israel and in, in Gaza with the Palestinian people right now. This is an opportunity for the church to be a light for Jesus Christ. So when we think about this, that is, that is how we should look at like current events and what is going on. But as believers, especially as we study our Bibles, it causes us to start asking questions right, about Israel, they are a special people when we read about them in the Bible. So much of Scripture talks about the nation of Israel, the land of Israel. But then a lot of Scripture talks about the church. And are those two things connected? Are they related? Are they separate? How are we to look at that relationship? And so just to set the stage for us, 
the two, two primary ways people tend to look at this. One, we would use, we would say it would be a traditional dispensational understanding of Israel. Now that's a big word. Dispensation is really just a way of ordering things. It's, it's a way of looking at things and categorizing them. And so when we think about that term in this context, we would say one way to look at Israel and the church is from a dispensational vantage point, which would say God had a plan and a way of dealing with Israel. There's a structure, there's a path, Right there, they were they were a, an age and a, and a part, and now there is the church part, and it is a separate, completely different category and age that God deals with in a different way. So that's one way of looking at what is going on in this relationship. Right? We would, as we unpack this tonight, what you're going to find is. It's hard to make that line up with what we read in Scripture, that very traditional way that God has a plan and way of dealing with Israel and a different way of dealing with the church. It's going to be hard to make that wash the Scripture, so we're going to unpack that a little bit. Another way people tend to look at this relationship is what we would term replacement theology, that God had Israel in the Old Testament, and now they were his people, and now they have been replaced by the church, right? That's the ditch on the other side of this road. Both of those don't really line up completely with scripture. So we've got to find what the, how does scripture deal with this? And a better way that we're going to look at tonight, a better way forward for us, is to see that there is this word that pops up in scripture in the Old Testament so many times, and we see it in the New Testament as well. And it is this idea of a remnant. Right In Israel, you had the nation as a whole, but there was always this remnant that believed, this remnant that put their faith in God, where you had the faithless nation, but there was a remnant who stayed true and faithful to Yahweh. We still see that remnant in the days of Jesus in the New Testament. So how does that word, we're going to see how it helps us make a connection to see what's going on here between Israel and the church. So that's just to kind of set the stage for you, whet your appetite a little bit, and we're going to jump in. All right, so if, if, if we just start with our Old Testament categories of people, okay, what people in, in your large buckets of the Old Testament, you would have, you would have Gentiles or the nations, and that would be represented by, right, the Canaanites, the Amorites, uh, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, and, and, and you have God dealing with Israel and, and then surrounded by the unbelieving nations. Okay? Secondly, you would have national Israel, that God is dealing with the nation of Israel as his covenant people underneath a overarching covenant promise and relationship with them as a nation. Okay, um, but as you work through that category, there, there's a third category of the remnant within Israel, and that remnant of saved people, people that actually know God. So you know this instinctively when you read your Bible, that there are people that are national Israel that do not know God in the Old Testament. You remember all the people that like rebelled against Moses uh, in the wilderness at Korah, and, and Moses was like, look, God says choose your side. And, and the people that stood over there with Korah, the ground opened up and swallowed, okay? Now, where did those people go? Right, right. We, we ask the question like, "Oh, but but they were Israel. Yeah, they may have been national Israel, but they they were not on God's team." Remember uh, a number of the horrendous uh, kings that uh, that even though they came from the lineage of David, right? David was God's man, and man, but but man, what do we do with Ahab? Okay, and and his, and his wife Jezebel, right? So you instinctively, by reading your Bible, you understand that, that well, you, you have these categories of, yes, you had national Israel, but 
But there was a remnant. There was this true Israel that exists like King David and Elijah and the prophets and Job. And, and I put in here on your sheet, e even Rahab and Ruth, because in the Old Testament, you, you had the ability to be an alien, to be an outsider, but you could join God's team and be welcomed in and incorporated with, with Israel, right? You, you could become a part, right? So this is important for us to understand. So let's go through this just a little bit. And I want, I want to show you scripture passages where this is laid out. Now, Paul does this a number of times in Romans 9, 10, and 11, and he looks back with some of these scripture quotations. Okay, So Romans 11, 1, I say then, has God not rejected his people? Has he? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite and a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Judah. Okay, and then he goes on to explain how in 1 Kings chapter 19, you guys remember 1 Kings chapter 19 is when Elisha is running from King Ahab and Jezebel. And Elijah runs, he's, he's fearful for his life. He goes all the way to Mount Horeb. He gets alone and uh, he, he talks to God. God says, why are you here? And Elijah says, I'm here and I'm all alone. I am the only prophet left. And then God says, no, no, no that's not true. There are 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. I have a remnant of those who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. Well, Paul in Romans 11 quotes that section out of 1 Kings 19 and talks about a remnant, okay? This idea, there is a remnant, a faithful, true Israel believing in the midst of the overarching uh, national Israel, okay? To, to, uh, to make the point again, Romans 9, verse 6, part of Paul's argument here. It's not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. In verse 6, he uses the word Israel in that same verse to mean two different things. In one way, okay, the first way, he, uh, he says Israel means the remnant, the true Israel, okay? For they are not all Israel, they are not all the true Israel who are descended from Israel. The second way he uses that word, he's referring to the nation of Israel. You see that in that text? They are not all the true Israel just because they are the nation of Israel, okay? In other words, you just can't be uh, of the flesh to be children of God. I'm going to show you two other quick passages. Isaiah chapter 10 uh, is a passage that is, is forward-looking. It, it gets quoted in the New Testament about um, a remnant of Israel that will return to the land. If you guys were in our thread study, uh, we, we covered this, that there is a new exodus theme that's woven throughout the scripture. I don't have time to go into that. Uh, but I want to show you that this idea of remnant, uh, this selected, saved people that is separate from just national Israel, okay? And I also want to show you in Micah chapter 5, tied to a passage that we know, Micah 5, 2, where it talks about, uh, but as for you, Bethlehem, there's, there's going to come one from you uh, to be a ruler in Israel, is going forth or from long ago, for uh, from the days of eternity. Who's that that comes out of Bethlehem? It was a, all right, so this is talking about the birth of Jesus. Look at what Micah 5 says about the birth of Jesus. Therefore, he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has born a child. Then the remnant of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel. Okay, so we should be looking and expecting this, this when the Messiah comes, this this remnant, this true Israel that is going to show itself, okay? 
So again, those three categories that you see, uh, you have Gentiles, you have national Israel, and then you have the remnant. That is the saved, the true Israel. Okay, so what, what this helps us do when we read Scripture, it reinforces something for us that we know, but we see it so clearly here, is that no one is saved, right? No one is brought in to this family, this people of God, because of bloodline, right? Just because they can trace their bloodline back to Abraham, that does not, that is not what makes them right with God and part of his people. So we see that here in these verses. Paul talks about it too. He goes on and makes it very clear in Romans chapter 2. Look what he says in verse 28. No one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly. So there we see picking up that same thing, right? Israel used two different ways. He's using this here. No one is a Jew who is just a Jew outwardly, right? And he goes on and uses the comparison circumcision, right? It's not a physical act, right, of circumcision that makes you right with God. He says, no, it's a circumcision of the heart by the spirit. That is it. So what is that teaching us? What's that showing us? Is that salvation in the Old Testament is looking by faith forward to what God was going to do in Jesus, just like now we look back in faith to what Jesus did on the cross. So true Israel, true the true people of God, whether it's Old Testament people who have a bloodline they can trace to the physical person of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or whether it's you and I today who have bowed our knee and professed Jesus Christ as king, we come to him the same way, by faith, by faith. We see that again in Romans chapter 4. He says, look, how was Abraham, this blessing then on the circumcised or on the one is it also on the one earth uncircumcised awkward? Also, it says, for we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. Right? It's by faith, not circumcision, but by faith. Right? Look on in verse 11. He is sealed, a seal of the righteousness of faith. So you see the point that God is making, that scripture is making for us about who we view as God's people? Right? It is true Israel. This remnant language points to those who by faith has come to God. So hopefully that's, that's helpful there as we kind of continue this understanding. All right, so so far we've only established those three groups in the Old Testament. Gentile, the nation of Israel, and then the remnant, the true Israel. Now what happens to those three groups when Jesus shows up? Okay? What happens in the New Testament? Well, uh, you probably know instinctively, right, from reading your Bibles, from being good readers, that the remnant, they're the faithful ones that are, have been anticipating. They, they are there, uh, and have, God is talking to them, and they receive the promises when Jesus shows up. So, so think of Zechariah and, and Elizabeth, and, and oh, you, you're... Your son gets to be the forerunner. And Mary and Joseph, they're they're faithful. And Simeon and Anna, right? You got to see the Messiah. So so there are faithful ones. This is the remnant that when Jesus shows up, okay? And then Jesus calls his disciples, and they follow, right? And and don't just think of the 12, right? The disciples were 72 in, in large groups, and there were groups of women. So when you pay attention to the Gospels, there, there were entire groups that came all the way from, uh, from in, up in Galilee and made the journey for Jesus' crucifixion. Large groups, faithful people. And then think through in Jesus' ministry uh, of him coming in contact with, with people that, that were outcasts at the time. Think of Zacchaeus tax collector as sinner, but he turned out to be a faithful limit because he got saved, right? Jesus showed, he got saved. And, and think of the people that, uh, uh, that, that Jesus healed or, or the blind beggar that's on the side of the road and he cries out, son of David, have mercy on me, son of David. And Jesus goes and heals him. This is the faithful remnant that begins to show up all through the New Testament. In addition to that, 
we, we see that that circle gets slightly expanded. Jesus' ministry overwhelmingly is to, uh, is to Israel. But remember the Samaritan woman at the well. Remember the Gerasene demoniac. Okay? Uh, remember the, uh, uh, when, when Jesus went to, to Tyre, uh, it, it, it's a short little snippet. You, you only get one little snippet. Jesus goes outside of Israel to Tyre, and there's there's a woman whose daughter is demon possessed, and he she begs him to heal. And 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 Jesus says, I I've only come for for Israel. It's, it's not good to to give the dogs the scraps from the table. And she said, Well, even the dogs get fed. I've never seen such things. So, so there are those, and, and what will that? That is the the remnant. That is the faithful ones who see and believe. And, and so we we get to see that also by by understanding who's rejected, right? We see the faithful remnant, but who are those that are rejected? Think about the gospels and who we read. Who are the ones that Jesus points to and and says, "You brood of vipers, right? You, you disbelieving, right? You, you are." You aren't sons of Abraham, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, national Israel. Think about that large category. Jesus is quick to say, no, (laughs) you you are not part of of this remnant. Uh, The unrepentant cities that we see, that whole cities that he says, Chorazin, Bethsaida, even Capernaum, right? We were we were just standing there in the ruins of this city just a few months ago, right? And thinking about that verse where he says, you know, if the works that I have done had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented, right? They would have returned, but you rejected me. You rejected the Messiah. His own hometown of Nazareth, right? He, 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 he leaves and says a prophet is without honor in his hometown. Now, they did not believe. And so it just is another one of those reminders for us that national Israel is not the true saved Israel that is the seed of Abraham that we read about in a passage that we've given you there in your handout in Galatians chapter 3. Starting, look at verse 16. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say and to seeds as referring to many Right, you've got the Jesus seed and you've got the Jewish Israel seed. No, it's rather one. And who is that seed? Where does it originate? And to your seed, that is Christ. Verse 29, and if you belong to Christ, then you are whose descendant? Abraham's descendant. Heirs according to the promise. After Christ's ascension, the Holy Spirit falls on true Israel. Okay, right? The disciples, they gather together. The Holy Spirit falls, fills them. It's now the new temple. Now what's important to read and to understand as you're reading in Acts, look at what it says in verse 5. Now there were Jews in Jerusalem devout men from every nation under heaven. And then Acts 2 goes on to list that, uh, that the scattered from all over uh, the empire had gathered to Jerusalem at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit falls. I show this to you because you remember that Micah 5.3 passage that said when he comes, right, he will gather the remnant. That is what is being described here in Acts chapter 2, that that remnant, that is now Holy Spirit filled Okay, that's what's happening at Pentecost. Now, we just walked through the book of Acts. For the, for, for up until chapter 8, there's this repeated theme. And I beat it like a drum, right? If you say what to what I'm about to say, I'm, I'm going to be sad. Uh, <laughs> and, and that is, do you guys remember the number of times over and over that the, uh, that the disciples were told, you must, you must go give witness at the temple. You must. You must go stand right there in the temple courtyard and he must preach the good news of Jesus, okay? He, he allows them to, to perform a miracle right there on the spot and thousands are saved, right? That's the remnant. There's Holy Spirit filled. And, and there's this constant opposition with the leaders, with nat- national Israel. The leaders are uh, throwing them in jail and uh, uh, 
An angel comes and lets them out of jail. And that angel said what to them? Go right back to the temple. You must. You must. And for, for those eight chapters, there, there's this drum that's beaten. And then the persecution of Stephen. And suddenly the church spreads out and is scattered. And we know that this is now the gospel begins to go to the Gentiles. Okay? And, and they start to believe that everywhere that Paul went, he would go first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. And, and every time, uh, almost unanimously, there, there, were, there were small pockets of Jews that would believe, but categorically, the synagogue would reject. And then you, you go all the way to the end, and we just covered how did the end of Acts finish? The exact same. Paul made it to Rome. What did he do? He gathered together as many Jewish leaders that would listen to him, and he preached the gospel, there were a few that believed, but categorically they reject. And then the, the, the end of Acts says, well, I will go to the Gentiles. They will listen. So let's look at, um, in your, on your next page there, of your notes, there is an analogy that Paul uses. Where I didn't get at this. Or not. Okay, you had my five in there a second time. Not bad. No, I'm going to get hit. Slides. There's an analogy that Paul uses in Romans chapter 11 where he uses the picture of an olive tree and he's using it to define for us true Israel, remnant of the Old Testament, and that that is equal to also the, what we see in the church in the New Testament. And so when you read this passage of Scripture, I'm not going to take time to read it for you. You can read those verses. But what I want you to see in this Scripture is that there's one tree. There's not two olive trees. There's not, there's not Israel is a tree and the church is a tree. Right? The way way Paul is helping us to see this, to understand this, is that there is one singular tree. There is one true Israel. There's one true people of God. There was a tree, and the Gentiles, those of us who have placed our faith in Christ, we are grafted into this tree with those Jewish people who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Christ, right? So that gets back to where we set this up a minute ago, where we said that how do we know you can't really, some of these ways of thinking are off biblically, where we said dispensational, right? That would be this idea there's two trees, right? And, and we see here in Romans 11, no, there's not two trees. There's one tree. We also see in here, Paul doesn't say that there was a tree that was cut down, which is Israel, and now there's a new tree, which is the church, so Israel has been replaced. No, it says there is a tree, right? The branches were broken off and cast out that didn't believe, but these believing Gentiles were grafted into this one tree. So both of those ditches, right, trying to replace Israel with the church, but also trying to say God's got two plans of how he is dealing with his people, Right in two different ways. That also is doesn't line up with what Paul is, is saying here in Romans chapter eleven when he's trying to help us understand what God is doing with Israel after Christ. Yeah, it, some some of you may not be able to listen to me because you're you're already thinking, well, what about national Israel? But we're getting to that. We're continuing to stay laser focused on this point here. That is that the remnant, that group of the remnant from the Old Testament, as it transfers over to the New Testament, is the church. Okay? I want to show you some scripture verses that, uh, that take, these are New Testament verses, that take promises and language that was given to promised true Israel, but is given in language that's given to the church. So I, I, I want to show you that the New Testament does this, and I'm giving you a category for that, why it is this way. We're not talking about replacement theology. I'm, I'm telling you, it's that remnant category. The remnant category becomes the church. So watch this. First Peter chapter 2. Uh, Peter... Uh, writing to the church that's scattered in 
uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 1, says, But you, church, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. And you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Guys, those are titles. Titles that you can see right below in Exodus 19 that were given to Israel. Okay? Now, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my commandments, then you shall be my own possession amongst the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the sons of Israel. But in 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter clearly applies those to the church. Why is that? Because there's one olive tree. Because we've been grafted in. The promises given to true Israel transfer to the church. We will come back to national Israel, but the promises given to true Israel are transferred to the church. You see it again in Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. There's no doubt. He's writing to the seven churches. But in the end, verse 6, he has made us to be a kingdom priest to his God and Father. Again, same titles, promises now applied to the church. Have you ever paid attention to the opening in James 1? James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad. Greetings. Yet you work through the book of James and uh, it's actually clear he's writing to churches. He, he says, hey, when you gather together, don't, don't give a prominent seat to, to the rich man. Right? He's writing to churches. He says, call the elders together. He's writing to churches. So why here does he say to the 12 tribes who are dispersed? Well, guys, you have to have a category to think through this. Okay, and I'm giving you a category, and that is the remnant of true Israel, the church, they are one and the same. You can also see Galatians 6.16 calls the church uh, the Israel of God. And Philippians 3.3 3 calls the church the true circumcision. All right, so so have we, have we spent enough time kind of beating this drum about how we see what true Israel, the remnant, we kind of understand, we see this language in Scripture. It's clear what God is talking about, about who these believe who these believing people are, who this olive, this true olive tree is. But I know the question, Pastor Jason alluded to it before, the thing you may have zoned out on until we got here, what is the future of national Israel? What about the nation? Or what's going on there? Well, Paul, Paul addresses that in Romans 9 through 11. He asks the same question, like, what is God going to do with the nation as a whole? We get it. We understand who true Israel is, the true seed of Abraham, or those who have believed and placed their faith in Jesus. But what about the nation? Right? Paul is asking that too. What about his kinsmen according to the flesh? In Romans 9, he says he, he's grieving the fact that even though the promises came from them, right? They have the covenants, they have the promises, they have the prophets, they have all of these things, they have Moses, but yet he's lamenting the fact that they have categorically rejected the gospel. And he says, I wish that I could be cursed and cut off if it meant that the nation, if my people, my kinsmen could be grafted in, could be Saved could could have their eyes open and see this. They have not come, right? So Paul goes on later in chapter nine to explain this idea that the election, the choosing of Israel, was never meant that it was for every biological Jewish descendant of Abraham, right? It, it is a gift of God by grace that we receive 
through faith. It's always been that way. If you think back to what we saw in Romans 4 and 5, uh, Paul, even here in this passage, he quotes from Isaiah chapter 10, and we've got that for you here. We weren't doing very good again with our, with our flipping our, uh, charts. No, it's my fault. That's later. So, that's later. Did I skip ahead too much? All right, but look, look there on your sheet in front of you in Isaiah. Um, he quotes from Isaiah 10, verse 22, where he says, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel, right, national Israel, be like the sands of the sea, it's the remnant. That will be saved. So Paul is asking these questions too. What is going to happen to the nation itself? Will their eyes be open? Will they come to faith? So in, in, in the, the end of chapter 9 and continuing through chapter 10, uh, Paul begins to unfold that Israel has, has stumbled. They have stumbled over the Messiah. Uh, Right. Categorically, they have rejected. Um, the main reason for this is because of their pride. And, and they come to God on the basis of works and not faith. Now, the Gentiles are streaming in. This is Paul's lament, right? Because he's, he's the apostle to the Gentiles and he, and he wants to know. Uh, so as he unpacks this, uh, he, he begins to give us reasons. They have stumbled because of their pride and because they do not come by faith. They come by their own works. Paul prays for them, by the way, meaning they can be saved. He wants them to be saved. He prays for them to be saved. Okay, And then in Romans chapter 11, so here's where we're going, where we're going to spend a, a little more time. And he again asks the question in Romans 11, has God rejected his people? No. He is not. Well, verse 1 through 6, he again says, listen, there's a remnant, and I am one of those. Okay? I'm a Hebrew, and I am saved. So the, the first way he says, look, there's a remnant. God hasn't rejected his people because there's a remnant. But he doesn't end there. Now he adds to that by telling us, look, well, what about national Israel? Okay, verses 7 through 10. They've been hardened. They've been given a spirit of stupor. Verse 11. Did they stumble so that they would fall? In other words, will it always be this way? No, it will not. Then he goes on and says, by their transgression... Salvation has come to the Gentiles. And then he gets a purpose in order to make them jealous, in order so that Israel will be jealous. Verse 12. Now, if their transgression in, is riches for the world and their future is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? Now, here's a pattern. I have a chart that a theologian did that I thought was good enough to include for you. By the way, you can go home and you can read all this. Um, it's, it's heavy. It's a dense section. That's why we're trying to go through it together. But I want to show you this pattern because five times in these verses, there is this pattern where you see uh, the rejection, the sin, the uh, trespasses of Israel, right? So the first category, the trespasses of Israel, their rejection, the natural branches broken up, the hardening, the disobedience, that's the first step. And then it leads to the salvation, the reconciliation of the world, right? The wild shoots grafted in, the fullness of the Gentiles, the mercy for the Gentiles. That's the second part. There is this progression. But then there's always this third part, that is their acceptance, their fulfillment, the natural branches being grafted back in. All of Israel will be saved. Uh, mercy to Israel. So there is this pattern, and Daniel's about to drill down with, with clarity on this final verse, but I want you to see the way that he argues. Yeah, after all of this, has God rejected his people? Well, there's the remnant. Yeah, but what about everyone else? Well, look, there is a hardening. 
Then there is uh, salvation to the Gentiles, but then there is an, an acceptance. So unfold this for us. So look on in verse in chapter 11. Look at verses 25 and 26. Let's read these. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, so that all Israel will be saved. So what do we, what do we learn from that passage? Right? Are we to believe that when he says all Israel will be saved, is that every single person who can trace their bloodline back to Abraham? Is that all Israel? I mean, think with the, with the lens that we've given you tonight. Who's he referring to when he says all Israel will be saved? Right? It's all those who, who believe in Israel. Right? So what is he saying here? That it, at a future time, Right, this partial hardening of the Jewish people during this season when the fullness of the Gentiles have, have come, it says there will be a time when national Israel, their eyes will be open in large numbers and they will see the truth of the gospel. They will see Jesus with clarity and as a people in larger numbers Right, they will come to faith in Jesus. That's what Paul is looking forward to. That says, "Will there will come a day where we see a revival of sorts, where the Jewish people begin to see Jesus and place their their faith in Him." That is what he says is is the future. That is what is in store for the people of Israel when he says, "And so all Israel will be saved." With a warning, right? And that is, do not be arrogant in your own eyes. Understand that a partial hardening, according to the plan of God, okay? By the way, these are God's plans, okay? I didn't make any of this up. You didn't make any of this up. This is way above all of our pay grade. This is God's movement from all of eternity to uh, it, the ebb and flow of how the gospel will go to the ends of the earth. And, and in this movement that there is currently a partial hardening of Israel as the Gentiles flood in and then, and then he uses that to bring them to jealousy. Yes, there's still a remnant of, of uh, Israelites that are currently saved, but we are looking, we are longing and looking forward to a time when that, when that hardening, when that veil would be removed and that they would see, and that, that they would see the Christ that we see. And, and that's, that's why this is so, uh, those five before, like how much more awesome will it be when the natural branches can see it, right? When they can see it, hallelujah, what that's going to be. It's, it's humbling, isn't it? When we, when we read these passages and we think about, right, it helps to center us, right? Because we can get so man-centered in our theology, right? Where we think we know best and we go, well, this is the way I would have done it. And this is what, this is easy for me to think this way, so I'm going to think this way. This presses us to actually humble ourselves before him. Like Jason was saying, that's what I want to make me think and want to refer back to. These are God's plans, right? He is sovereign over all. And so it helps to humble us and bring us back to center, to understand uh, that he is in control. He is all powerful. He is all knowing. He has had this plan since before the foundation of the world, right? To send his son, to bring redemption and and to use the Jewish people, right? And then to, to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, but then to open the eyes of the Jewish people to see it again with clarity, right? This is all his working, right? It, it ought to humble us, but then reassure us of what he is doing and how his plans are going forth and cannot be thwarted. So let's ask the question. Remember those three categories, right? You have Gentile nations, you have the remnant in the true church, okay, the true people of God, and then you have national Israel. And, and so the, the church does not have any uh, 
uh, land, any uh, nation, uh, no, uh, no king besides Jesus, right? The, the church functions uh, that way. But now you have an interesting question uh, as we're looking forward to this idea of Israel as a nation uh, coming to salvation in mass with uh, in, into faith with Jesus, then, then you ask the question, this often gets debated, well, well then what about the land? Okay, that land, that small piece of land that the entire world is ready to fight over. What about that land? Okay, uh, you can see here, this is a highly debated topic, uh, but most Christian theologians think uh, that this returning to a nation state of Israel uh, is going to be, uh, is direct fulfillment of prophecy, and that occurs as a sign of the end and is attached to the land. Okay? Uh, that, that is a, a, I don't know, I'd probably say two thirds out of one third in terms of uh, position. And, and you can read articles on both sides and uh, I'm trying to present as even, I, I care about you understanding uh, rather than. My own personal opinions or such, and so uh, so think through. Uh, most Christian theologians think with this national Israel and this revival that it needs to be tied to a land and, and the promises of that land stretching all the way back uh, to Abraham and seeing that fulfillment and, and certain prophecies within the Old Testament of a calling people back to the land. All right, here's a doozy. What about an end-time temple? <coughs> Again, very highly debated. You have two options. There's an end-time temple or there's no end-time temple. Um, very debated. On one hand, you have to deal with passages, and I have just a couple listed out here, uh, that speak of possible future events occurring in a temple in Jerusalem. Okay? Some people t take uh, those uh, uh, those passages uh, and say that they are looking forward to AD 70. So uh, at the writing of all these passages, uh, the, the fall of, of uh, Herod's temple has not occurred yet. Okay? Uh, there were events surrounding the fall of that temple that some people take uh, to mean that some of these passages were fulfilled. You've got to determine uh, whether that holds water, and lots of people will argue about whether it does or not. Um, but this is where the discussion follows. Okay, does there have to be a rebuilt temple? Well, yeah, there are some passages that you need to have an abomination and desolation that occurs in that in that temple. There needs to be an entire temple. Okay, that's one side of of verses that you need to wrestle with, but, but the other side of verses that you need to wrestle with and, and you must take into account, and that is, I did this, this whole study on threads with the temple, okay, and that is, there's a movement that goes through scripture with the temple. It, it starts in Eden, and then it's the, the tabernacle, and then it's the temple, and then it's Jesus, and that the temple where God's presence was, uh, was a type that was pointing to Jesus. And John unfolds that for us magnificently. John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. And then in John chapter 2, when Jesus says, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days, he was talking about his body. Okay, so Jesus is the God's presence. He is that temple. And then that temple moves to where? Where's the temple after Jesus? Us, right? God's presence, the, the veil was torn into God's presence is no longer in a building. It's now in his people, okay? So you need to understand that movement, and then you, you, then you have to ask yourself questions. Well, if an end time temple came back, is God's presence going to go back in that temple? Because that's the only thing that makes it a temple is God's presence, not just the building. So then you have to wrestle with those questions. And one other passage that I do want you to see, because I want to show you, that in the same way that I showed you, uh, the New Testament takes some of the, the language that's applied to Israel and then applies it to the church and gives some of those passages. I want you to see what James does here in Acts chapter 15. So Acts chapter 15, does anyone remember the context? 
holler it out. This is your participation. <laughs> the Jerusalem Council. Okay, the discussion is all around uh, the, the Gentiles are receiving. Uh, uh, they're receiving Christ. There, there's a lot of discussion around that. And, and Peter stands up and he gives the explanation that the Gentiles are being filled with the Holy Spirit the same way that the Jews are. So James stands up and says, hey, Simon, that's Peter. He's related how God first concerned him okay, about the Gentiles and people for his name. Now listen to this. And with this, the words of the prophets agree. And then he quotes Amos 15, 14 through 17. But look at what he quotes. I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins. I will restore it. But James is talking about Gentiles being filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's the reason that, uh, uh, that, that they're going to issue the verdict that they do. But when you read that, he said, I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins. I show that to you because you've got you to gotta roll up your sleeves and you've got to figure out some of these passages and how they're being used. It, it seems but pretty clear here that James is saying that Amos 15 was fulfilled in the gospel going and filling the Gentiles, and the Holy Spirit filling the Gentiles. Okay? All right. So, uh, end time temple, I mean, my straightforward answer is I don't have a clue. I don't understand, I don't understand how an end time temple works, uh, so it confuses me. Uh, I don't know what to do with some of those passages that, that talk about an end time temple, and so I shrug, and, and on those, I, I kind of punt, and I defer to people who are way smarter than me, and uh, I don't know. Okay, that's, that's, that's my God honest answer. I don't know uh, about that end time temple. That said, uh, I, I wanted to end with all that we've covered with this final thought for us, okay? So I say here, look, Politics aside, and prophecy aside, the author of Hebrews gives us a magnificent picture that I think that for me, pastorally, with my people, with you, my people, here is where I want your aim and your, your focus, okay? The author of Hebrews wants to detail for us where true peace and true rest comes from. And part of the way he argues in chapters 3 and 4, uh, by the way, I, I did a thread on this uh, called Rest in the Land. Uh, if you were part of that thread series, that is, there's a lot of information there, but let me give you the quick summary. When when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, they had lost the rest and the peace of God. As Israel is coming out of Egypt and going into the promised land, much of the language of, I'm going to give you a land that's flowing with milk and honey, it's described in idyllic terms, like they are returning back to Eden. And it's promised repeatedly. I give you a lot of verses here. Like, hey, you're going to enter the land. Ah, and you're going to have a rest there. Man, when you get in that land and I will give you rest from your enemies, it is going to be awesome. And it's described in these uh, Eden terms. Okay? And, and then when Joshua goes in, it, I hold this to verses. And Deuteronomy and Joshua, and, and Joshua ends, and he's conquered uh, and at the end, and it, and it says, and, and they had a rest from their enemies, okay? That's the language that gets repeated over and over again. But they messed things up, right? But, but then there's a king who's after God's own heart, King David. And David comes, and when he sits on the throne, he drives out all the enemies, and he is prosperous, and, and there is peace. And it says that he gets to the point of rest. Okay? And then he wants to build God uh, a temple. And then 
uh, and then when Solomon builds the temple, he says, God has given us rest from all of our enemies. Not one promise that was promised back there didn't come true. We've got it. We have the land. We have a rest from our enemies. We have peace. Okay? But, this, this is the way the author of Hebrews argues. He says, listen, David, in Psalm 95, warned the people, told the people. You, you have all of that right here. Uh, you, you have Hebrews 3 and 4 along with Psalm 95. Okay? But just listen to me. You can go back and read it and study it. Tell me if I said it wrong. Okay? But David, in Psalm 95, he's calling the people to worship. And when he calls the people to worship, he says to them, Today, if you hear his voice, you better respond. Do not be like those who tested the Lord in the past and did not enter his rest. Now, the author of Hebrews, the point that he's making in 3 and 4, is, but guys, David was in the land. He had all the land. He had all the riches. He had rest from his name. He had everything. Why is it that he was still calling the people to a spiritual rest? A rest that was to come. And then the author of Hebrews says, that rest is only found in Jesus. Okay? That rest is found in Jesus. So this is the picture I want you to think of as we close out our discussion about Israel. And here's why. Because when we talk about Israel, and when you think about Israel as a nation, the ideal is what if Israel could get back everything that it has lost. If we could just go back to King David, if we could get all the land, if we could get all the prosperity, if we could get all the peace around the outside. This is the way our minds work. If we could just get back to those times. But listen to David himself, who had all the land, who had all the rest from his enemies, who had all the prosperity. He said, today, if you hear his voice, you need to respond to the spiritual rest that only comes from Jesus. It only comes from Jesus. So, so, so we can wrestle and arm wrestle over all the particular details about when this happened and when that happens, but listen to me. Even if they get all the land and even if they get rest from all the enemies, they need the rest that only comes from Jesus. Amen? Amen. Only from them. That's the point that the author of Hebrews makes in chapter 4. And the good news is, guys, we in this room, that rest is greater than any other thing. Okay? So that's where pastorally we really want to just focus and land this discussion. I'm happy to field questions and to talk about those things. And it's good, it's right for us to roll up our sleeves and to think well. But in the end, right, the rest that comes from him and only him, apart from and the enemies and all of that stuff. So there's like a couple of things like as we think through this, I hope there's a couple of points like for application, like leaving here tonight, thoughts that you take with you. One, right? If you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, you are part of that true Israel, that true people of God who have been brought into his family, who have an inheritance, who belong to him. And that is something to leave here celebrating. That's something to leave here with confidence and assurance to know that he has chosen you and you belong to him. What a wonderful thing for us here tonight to leave with. Amen? Yeah. Right? And another thing to leave here tonight with is what Jason was just referring to, right? It's that warning that we see so clearly in the pattern of Israel, right? They were always trying to achieve and reach like these promises of God, but do it in their own way, 
right? They were trying to accomplish these things without submitting to the authority of God in their lives. They were trying to achieve rest without coming to him, right? So what a great point of application for us to examine our lives, to say, am I repeating those, <laughs> those patterns, right? Because I'm prone to it, I'm prone to wonder, right? But do I truly understand that true rest will only come from him, right? And I can't manipulate it, I can't force God's hand, Right? We can see people in Israel today, right? They're gathering all the furnishings to rebuild a temple. Why? They're trying to force God's hand. If we build it, he will come. Right? I mean, that's kind of that idea. And, and you think, well, how silly. But then I stop and think, but don't I do that all the time? Where I'm like, God, I've done it. Now bless me. Right? I did it my way, but I want you to bless it. Right? And so there's a couple of things there that just thoughts as we as we get ready to start winding this down. Those are ways for us to think about this and take it and, and kind of bring it home into the way we think, the way we approach him, the security, the assurance we have, the warnings that we should apply and be in our own lives. So there's a lesson for us there to, to take with us. Okay. We got 15 minutes. <laughs> should we do it or should we just land and go home and let all these happen? <laughs> I mean, I hear land and go home. Uh, FYI, just, just if you want to know where we're going with the next two, uh, next time we're going to do uh, uh, we're going to do an overview of the book of Revelation. Over okay. you, large categories, vast, a book of Revelation. High level. You'll love it. It'll be great. Uh, and, and then, and then we will follow it up the next week, and we will drill down a little deeper in uh, particular spots in the book of Revelation and uh, talk about important applications that, that come from that. Okay? And that one is really meant as we landed to show how as believers, even looking at the end, some of that scary imagery that we see in Revelation, how that is believers, there's still hope, right? That's what we want to leave you with as we finish this, is the hope that we have, the confidence that we have, even when we look at these things that might be a little confusing. So when we look at those pictures, the press is going to be the scene the good news of, of the gospel that we see that shines out of us. Awesome. Let me pray for us. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your goodness to us, that through your Son, we can know you, that you call us your own, that we are grafted into the true people of God. Father, I, I confess early on in reading some of your word, I, I would... I would mourn that I was not part of Israel, but then to, to see that through the promise of your son, you, you apply your, your truth and your promises to me, and you call me your own. And I, I pray uh, that all of us in this room can have that confidence, that assurance uh, that we are uh, children of Abraham according to the promise and the blessing because, because of your son. Uh, Father, as we leave, we also want to, as Christians, uh, to uh, we pray for uh, the peace of Israel. We pray for um, what is going on in the horrific events that have occurred over the course of the last month or so, um, and and we pray for uh, for people um, to come to faith in you. Uh, we certainly. Uh, pray for the United States and for our leaders uh, to have wisdom and understanding uh, to align with uh, our allies and to strengthen and to keep those bonds. Um, help us, Father. We, we pray for our leaders. Um, but over it all, we pray for more and more people to come to faith in you. And, and if it would occur in our lifetime to be able to, uh, to see an outpouring of of your Jewish people come to faith and, and be saved. Oh, how magnificent that would be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.